I think we can start. And uh, can you hear me here? Yes, good. Okay. So, welcome to the security session. And uh, it's always quite hard to be the last session of the day. And uh, it looks like there are not that many people as with the public dashboards. So, uh, we we'll, don't need to switch the room. So, we are quite comfortable with that. Yeah, and uh, thanks for the previous session on public dashboards that spent a lot of time in security. So we probably will skip some slides here, or at least they will complement uh, the topic. And uh, today we have uh, four different presentations, uh, one from me and three from our external speakers, guests, and all the topics are super interesting. So I was very excited to see them together and this is the first time when we have a dedicated security track at uh, the hs2 conference and uh, welcome to the session so this one is about the hs2 security features and i realized that although we know them quite well we never had it anywhere listed together so the session is an attempt to bring all the security features together, try to explain them or remind about them and uh, attract some attention to what we're working on. So it's a kind of a mix of what we already have from the, from the product perspective and uh, also what we are working on as a security team. And uh, it might be quite useful just to remind to see what we have and maybe it will trigger discussion of on what we don't have. And the last practical announcement of the day, uh, today and tomorrow after all the sessions, I will be present in the uh, experts lounge and can uh, answer any of the security questions you have. Uh, if we have any questions during this session, please uh, ask at the end and uh, we'll have more time in the evening after all the presentations will be done. So uh, let's uh, start with security features. And uh, the first one is access control. It's a trivial one. It's a core functionality of DHS2. And uh, it can be configured everywhere and is essential. So users can belong to group and have role assignments, which dis explain what users can do with their, their permissions. And uh, every group can explain like admins, like uh, division users, like uh, field workers or whoever. And it's a way to segregate them across different regions, uh, types of responsibilities, and every role can within the group can have, uh, for, for the user can contain fine grained authorities. In addition to that, users can have restrictions based on the analytical dis dimensions and what can be exported to the reports. This is, as I mentioned, the core functionality, and uh, uh, as many of the products role management is a quite complicated task. So what we're working on is uh, trying to create automated reports on roles and uh, group assignments to ensure that role control uh, or access control is done properly. The next one is LDAP authentication. So there is quite a lot of confusion between LDAP and single, single sign-on. And uh, it's also the core functionality and in fact, the LDAP authentication resolves or two, two problems. It helps to resolve two problems. The first one is keeping a centralized directory of users, and um, which comes from Active Directory, Azure ID, OpenLDAP, or any other compatible service. And the second, it provides basic authentication with a password that is stored in the external LDAP directory. This is a core functionality that can be configured anywhere, and it's supported from the very first versions. Uh, however, uh, with the development of the technology, we don't recommend relying on LDAP solely. We recommend using single sign-on or any other solutions, which are present separately. In addition to sorry, in addition to LDAP, we have multi-factor authentication, and uh, 
during the recent months, surprisingly, I got quite a lot of questions if we, if we have it in the product. And uh, we emphasize this, that yes, we do, we do have multi-factor authentication. It's available since version 2.30. And you can use either Google Authenticator or any other uh, uh, compatible application for modern smartphones or even for, for feature phones that runs on the G2ME uh, platform for legacy legacy phones. The only requirement is to keep time synchronization in place, uh, which is uh, relatively easy on the devices connected to the cellular networks. So it is not only for the modern phones, you can use it on the low end devices in the emerging markets. And then we have single sign on, uh, which is available quite for a long time, and it supports OpenID Connect. And uh, it can be integrated with various platforms. We have several tutorials on how to do that. Uh, Okta Keyclock, Google Workspace, uh, Microsoft uh, SSO, it can be used with multiple services uh, quite widely. And we encourage the uh, users to test and uh, report what is not working. But at the same point of time, it's the preferred way to doing centralized and secure authentication. In the case you support, uh, you implement single sign-on, multi-factor authentication is uh, delegated to the uh, authentication provider or to the identity provider. Then we have personal access tokens. We, we use it quite uh, for a while, and even we had a security vulnerability recently in the personal access tokens implementation, uh, but uh, the feature, the vulnerability is now fixed and the feature is uh, generally available. So uh, we discussed it in relation with the dashboards that once you implement authentication, it is important to keep uh, the credential security and personal access token is one of the ways to uh, by uh, to avoid uh, storing user passwords in the authentication scenarios, especially avoiding basic authentication using API calls and other techniques that uh, help you to use non-interactive features of the product. Then user impersonation, this is a new feature and we would strongly uh, ask you to test and provide feedback on that. Uh, we have a documentation on how to use it in the uh, in the DHS2 documentation, but it's in, in short, it's an uh, ability to run uh, features and uh, interact with the system on behalf. So we would like to inform that we definitely recommend having database backup everywhere. And uh, there are top, uh, semi official tools or the part of the tools that we recommend that can help you to backup your Postgres instances. And uh, the very new addition to that, for those who use our security uh, feature stack, it's called virtual patching. We started applying virtual patches to or recommending virtual patches for the configurations that run be behind the reverse proxies. So if your DHS2 instance sits behind the Nginx proxy, uh, you can, uh, and there is a known vulnerability or a set of vulnerabilities that can be potentially uh, harmful to the system. We uh, issue from time to time uh, security patches that can be applied and tested uh, on the test environments and you can apply them in production otherwise. It is a small piece of Nginx configuration that is a regex rule or some um, kind of a workaround that blocks or alters insecure requests or potentially malicious requests and you can uh, use, using use, using these patch, patches, you can mitigate the vulnerability or temporary mitigate the vulnerability by uh, applying this patch before you prepare to upgrade the uh, DHS2 version to the next secure release. This is an experimental feature. It uh, is not always available and not all types of the vulnerabilities can be fixed that way, but we think that it is a good addition to the whole stack and we experiment quite a lot with uh, virtual patching and it is quite easy to apply and test. So this is kind of an imp important addition to our security program. Then uh, a couple of updates on what we, we've been working on. Uh, so let's start with the reference setup. So the first uh, problem that we generally have with testing security is that all installations of DHS2 are unique 
and the most of uh, implementers use different operating system platforms, releases, uh, different support styles, methods, tools, and uh, whatever. And uh, it is quite hard for us to recommend a universal or kind of a general way of ensuring security of the systems. So that's why we came with the idea of the reference setup, which is a dedicated installation or the preferred way of configuring the system, where, where we test uh, new security features, where we test protection, and where we suggest everyone to perform public penetration testing of our instances. So this is uh, the dedicated setup where uh, using the recommended components. And you can either compare all the setup is done in public, so you can download this, uh, the configuration files, and you can use uh, uh, any security tools to test it, or uh, you advise your penetration testers or third-party consultants to make a penetration test of this instance. And this is same, the same uh, approach we have internally. So we, once we release a new version, we continuously test it using this kind of setup. And uh, you can probably compare what we have set up uh, using uh, any of the inventory that will be also presented today uh, by another uh, speaker and uh, using this tooling you can uh, check that how different your setup is from the ideal security configuration that we have and uh, also we started working actively with, with community and we launched the security hall of fame where uh, we mention credits to the researchers who submitted vulnerabilities or important security updates to the dhs2 product so this is uh one more way of interacting and we are going to promote a uh, crowdsourcing uh, approach to security and uh, encourage more people to look for vulnerabilities in dhs2 because security is a, a joint effort for everyone that's it from my side if you have any questions uh this uh, please uh, ask we have a couple of minutes and uh, after that uh, if you'd like uh, we can talk after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, blessings Kamanga from Malawi Ministry of Health. So together with my colleague. Uh, my name is uh, Brett Onions, um, as well joint, uh, from the Ministry of Health in Malawi. Yeah, so we'll be presenting on uh, strengthening information security uh, in DHS2 implementation uh, in Malawi. Yeah, so in the presentation, uh, we'll talk about uh, the Malawi HS architecture as well as uh, a bit of DHS2 implementation. And then we'll talk a bit about information security. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, the strategy that we have put in place uh, to ensure that uh, we have strengthened our uh, DHS2 implementation. So to give a background, uh, we started implementing uh, DHS, uh, DHS uh, 2 in the early 2000s. So during that time, it was just uh, DHS version 1. And then in 2013, that's when we started implementing the web-based uh, version. Uh, and then uh, that time, it was just correcting the routine aggregate data on the uh, health service delivery. Uh, but later in 2019, uh, we developed the one surveillance platform 
and uh, it is this platform that we used uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, to ensure that we capture the surveillance data as well as the, uh, the vaccination data. And it is the same platform that uh, we used to uh, uh, have data that would help uh, in responding to the cholera outbreak uh, in Malawi. And then uh, in 2021, I think yesterday we had a good presentation on the integrated community health information system. So we uh, have uh, that system. So in terms of uh, data capturing, uh, the lowest level is at the community level. And then uh, we also have uh, data being collected uh, at health facility level, and then it gets aggregated uh, as we uh, go up. Now, uh, with uh, all those uh, systems, uh, you'd notice that uh, uh, at each level, uh, we have uh, different systems that are being used. Uh, and then, for example, I talked of the ICAS on the community level, and then uh, as we go up, uh, we have all those uh, other systems. So uh, at the bottom level, we are collecting more individual uh, level data, and then uh, it gets aggregated uh, up there. So with uh, that, uh, it calls for a uh, security. We have to ensure that for the individual level data, uh, not everyone uh, is just accessing it. And how we need to ensure that uh, only those who are supposed to access uh, that data are indeed uh, accessing the uh, the data. Now, uh, to ensure uh, that all those systems are also talking to uh, each other, uh, we uh, implemented uh, the interoperability layer based on the Open Health Information Exchange uh, uh, framework. So we have uh, on the bottom the individual level uh, data collection systems, and then we have an uh, interoperability layer uh, in the middle, and then we have uh, the business uh, domain services and the register services uh, that will do, uh, ensure that uh, there is uh, that uh, interoperability. Now, when we come to uh, uh, information security, most of the times people think uh, of information security as just having a username and a password. But it goes beyond. It goes beyond that. So, for example, uh, if we uh, th there are some areas that are neglected. So, if we borrow the medical terms, uh, would look at uh, the other uh, aspects as maybe neglected uh, tropical diseases. So, we have uh, some other areas uh, that are neglected. So, for example, it goes beyond the username and the password. It goes beyond ensuring that uh, only uh, the, the, the systems are available and also uh, the data that is in that system uh, that doesn't uh, just uh, get uh, modified uh, anyhow. So, it's only uh, when you, uh, we understand the cost that comes uh, with information security. So those are some of uh, examples uh, where information security read uh, to uh, uh, expense of uh, uh, several uh, pounds, okay? Now, uh, in order to strengthen the information uh, security, we have uh, to do more. So there are several things that we have to do. So these range from uh, political will, uh, having legislatures and the like. So for example, uh, in America, uh, we have the uh, uh, health insurance uh, port uh, portability and accountability uh, act uh, hyper and then in the uh, eu region we have uh, uh, the general data uh, uh, protection regulation which regulates how the uh, individual level information uh, uh, can what uh, can be shared so uh, we have to put in uh, measures that uh, would ensure that uh, we strengthen uh, our system. So I'll call upon uh, my colleague, Brett, just to uh, highlight uh, what uh, measures uh, we are putting in place, uh, we are planning to put in place uh, in Malawi to ensure that we strengthen our uh, DHS2 implementation. Okay, uh, thank you very much, blessings. Uh, so to go off what you were saying, um, I'll be going over what measures we'll be putting in place in order to strengthen our uh, uh, information security. So uh, going forward, we'll actually have a completely separate um, department, I could say, uh, on, inside the Digital Health Division, specifically focusing on uh, security and privacy. As uh, Blessings had uh, iterated, uh, I mean, uh, as, as Blessing has stated earlier, um, a lot of what's initially thought of as security is just a username and password, but uh, you know, trying to educate people and trying to make sure that not only is it a username and password, it's not just password one, two, three, and making sure all of that is enforced as well. 
Um, so the, as you see in this diagram here, there'll be specifically um, three government staff, uh, technical support, and total of six people who are helping um, drive this security, um, this, this drive for better security. Um, as well, um, we'll be uh, applying the ISO 27001 uh, standard. Um, we've uh, gone as gone as far as uh, had trainings. Um, how many how many individuals was it again? I think it was three, four. It was four individuals we we had trained for the the, the standard. Um, and uh, of course, um, like uh, like has been iterated so many times throughout this uh, policy is is really really important um, because ultimately the not every not every environment is the same, and ultimately the, the the ISO standard is is that it provides standards, but we also need to address certain um, certain key challenges we we encounter in uh, in Malawi, uh, as well uh, continuous monitoring, evaluation, security risks, and uh, continuing to improve the the information security within the country. It's not a we do it and it's done. It's just an ongoing process. And the policy helps ensure that continuing uh, educating and training people also ensures that because um, some people don't even understand uh, the, the importance of security. You, you think you'd think that just having password one, two, three is bad. You find people even go as far as sending admin privileges over WhatsApp or just having it in a simple text file. So having to also uh, educate and train people to understand that having the security is important and having people actually accountable to the things that happen within their profiles. Uh, we're we're dealing with some very sensitive information. We don't want any of that to leak because ultimately for these systems to, to work, people have to have faith. So this this provides the, the, the framework for trust for our systems. I believe that's all, anything else? Yeah, yeah. so I uh, would like to uh, thank uh, the partners listed uh, on, the, uh, on the board for the support that they provide to the ministry. Uh, as well as for funding uh, uh, some other officers even to attend, uh, to attend this platform. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's our uh, presentation. Thank you. We take questions now. Yes. I'm not sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask a question actually on the um, uh, the slide on the organization where you have the privacy and security group. Is that it? Um, I think that's that's really great to see. I mean, and and also it's not just one person, right? You're talking about six people, so you're you're able to actually do some some real work on on privacy and security, which is really good. Um, I I was wondering, is this this is just within the Ministry of Health? So there is there also an uh, like a broader privacy and security organization that you're working with, or are there other ministries that have their own departments, or it's it's exclusively in the Ministry of Health for now? Um, I can say as far as this diagram here, it's just it's just the Ministry of Health. Um, I can't really say uh, I can't really say that um, uh, it's like any other dedicated um, dedicated privacy and security. Um, uh, divisions within the within the greater you know government and, and, and the like um of course we have uh, the regulations by like uh macra um there's telecommunications and other and the ict so that's what macra also uh, uh, is responsible for setting the policies for that so there there is some crossover there but as far as this goes in terms of dedicated staff it's just within the ministry of health got it thank you I also have a question. Um, recite just to here. Uh, how did you decide to implement ISMS? So, what was the key driver for that, or how did it start? Apart, because it's it's not a trivial choice because people, as you just mentioned, they sometimes they think about securing passwords, maybe doing some backups, uh, installing antivirus, but taking this kind of challenge, which is is quite advanced, it's very adorable. So, how how did it start for you? Uh, do you want to should I start or you start? I start. Um, so I could say, um, I guess the first problem is scale. Um, because we could say that the it was kind of handled across many different people, 
uh, myself included, Blessings as well, and our infrastructure and IT team. But as we've grown, as the and as the system has gotten more complex, um, the 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 push for this is because we've seen that it's kind of difficult for um, just you know juggling two hats and as complex and as complicated as security is, it's it was just decided that it needs to be its own its own section. There's an, its, its own department. Yeah. So uh, just to add. Uh, it's because now we are moving towards collecting the uh, individual level data. So there are more and more systems uh, that will be collecting. So with that, uh, we thought of at least uh, having something in place. As the saying goes, say prevention is better than cure. We don't have to end up with situations whereby we are spending some uh, money, uh, having lawsuits and the like. So uh, that's why we took uh, that direction. Yeah. Uh, had a couple of questions more, but we'll leave take you first. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess the first question that I had was uh, in relation to uh, check, and I think it's not just to this team, but I'm wondering what um, people do in terms of uh, securing data between, let's say, within the same organization. So let's say you've been given private data, and um, of course, um people you know we, we all sign some sort of confidentiality agreements but then maybe people work from multiple organizations have to access the same uh data at the right time how are you um looking into um securing that sort of data in terms of uh not just yes of course people can access it but avoiding people also modifying uh, other people's records. So that's mainly on the tracker side. And I, I think this is um, a follow on or still in the same specific area. Um, so I know that the audit, uh, the audit um, button, uh, it's a little human on the tracker, exists inside the tracker that you can be able to audit uh, historical changes on uh, DHS2. Um, but what I'm wondering is, if it's just consistently working for everybody else. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for that question. So I need much uh, uh, people from different organiz organizations uh, do uh, have uh, access to this data. But then uh, what we uh, have uh, in place, it's like uh, some sort of procedures. For example, uh, if someone is uh, accessing uh, the data, you have to uh, indicate why that person is accessing that data. And then also you have to indicate for uh, like uh, for how long uh, that data is being accessed. And the, uh, also uh, in terms of the system privileges and the like, uh, we have to ensure that we uh, give that person the uh, right uh, privileges so it could be maybe only a specific stage within the tracker program uh, and also uh, uh, the like. And then uh, like reviewing the system now, and uh, again, as uh, uh, Michael indicated, we have some logs and the like. So it's always important to review those uh, logs uh, now and uh, and then because you can detect uh, some of the uh, the things and the like. Um, well, just, just in a little bit of an addition to what Blessings has said. Um, uh, you know, earlier in, in my career, I thought the technology was the hard part. And ironically, the technology is the easy part. The difficult part is the people. So, of course, we can have the policies and procedures in place, but generally your biggest threat to your system is always the people on the inside. So you just have to keep keep an eye on everything. Of course, you know, you don't want to you don't want to be like completely, you know, uh, over their shoulder. But, you know, you want to just at least, like you said, with the auditing and, and logging. So generally, that's that's where the biggest challenge comes in. Um, I have uh, one more follow-up uh, question. Uh, so um, you mentioned that the reason for implementing ISMS was the scale. And to, just to, to give a bit more estimate, so I see on the slide uh, how many people you have, but what about just some approximate number? What, how many servers or laptops or how many uh, devices or assets you have? So you just understand the scale. Uh, geez, like 5,000. 
I'm thinking with it because we also have to take the, there's the laptops, there's the servers, there's the tablets, there's people using mobile phones. So it's I could throw it at like yeah, it's three, three, five thousand something like that. And it totally makes sense because at this scale, at this scale, uh, it's important. Yeah. And any other questions from the audience? Because I have one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, you thought that technology will be difficult, but then it turned out to be about people, right? Uh, from a technical perspective, like putting people aside, or maybe also including, but a bit more specific, what uh, was the most difficult on the way on implementing SMS? So what's the current, current what's the most difficult to handle while becoming compliant? Yeah, so uh, as I, as Brett said, people, uh, the difficult, the difficult part. So uh, we noted that, uh, for, 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 for example, uh, when people are asking for access, they would ask for open-ended access. So I just need a username and password, but then maybe they were project-based, the project is done, they don't even uh, release that access, they go. So uh, if we don't keep uh, an eye on that, uh, you notice that uh, with time, you have a lot of users that uh, are not even supposed to access the system, but because, you don't have a system in place that would like to say, okay, you get access for how long do you want the access? Two months, two months is gone. Uh, maybe you revoke uh, that access uh, and the like. But also uh, it's not uh, just about that, but also within the offices sometimes, because uh, there can be, that can lead to uh, some uh, information security breaches and the like, like how you put up the password. So for example, you're in the office, then you know you have lots of passwords, you take a sticker, write it sound you know much as the office has the keys but still more there's some things that you, uh, you have to be uh, responsible for so uh, there are all those uh, factors that uh, that are considered thank you any other questions how long did it take you to achieve your um accreditation how long did it take you to move through your period of accreditation until you received Okay, so uh, what we did, uh, we sent some uh, officers to the uh, British Standards uh, Institute uh, just to uh, go through the IOS, uh, ISO 27001 uh, in terms of uh, to implement it, what needs to be implemented. So. Uh, they were at BSI for uh, for one for one week, and then from there there were some action points which were drawn to say moving forward, uh, this is uh, what is uh, going to happen. But then uh, it's like a cycle, so uh, there'll be like a status and then continuous improvement, uh, having the meetings, uh, uh, assessing the risks, and the, uh, going on like that. Yeah. Okay, just a second. Um, thank you. So, thank you for your presentation. So, maybe I missed it, but my question is on uh, still on data security. So, how do you ensure data security issues at maybe at community level or at um, at facility level where you then collect data. I know you're going to give tablets to your data collectors. So how do you ensure that is secure? Do we have anything else? That's tough. Uh, let's say this first straightforward answer is that those are called the principle of least privilege. Only give people access to, or to uh, like as Blessings has stated, only give people access to what they need for a set period of time and, uh, just make sure you're you're monitoring how uh how that information is accessed um security is not perfect there's no 100 percent 100 secure system um you can just try your best to, to mitigate and try to see the best ways to um <clears throat> 
to at least know what's happening because the worst thing that can happen is a data leak and you have no idea what's what's going on and you know tomorrow you just find front page story just lots of personal information being published so i could say the simplest one is the least privilege just make sure you only give access to people for to uh in terms of the credentials make sure that um the policies are in place so that credentials are are secure in terms of the passwords um, only give uh, the acts don't you don't give someone into the system full access you only give them exactly what they need and just keep an eye on what they're doing yeah so uh just to add so at community level normally the healthcare workers they are given the uh, the tablets so with the tablets uh, it means there is uh, the component of the username and the uh, password and then apart from that uh because once you have logged in, it means you're always logged in. So there's also uh, that advocate to ensure that uh, they put an extra uh, password or even a fingerprint to ensure that they uh, do access. Uh, they are, it's only the person which is allowed to access uh, the tablet uh, does that. And then uh, because not everyone uh, may have a tablet, so there are some who opt to use their own uh, gadgets, of course, which is not uh, highly recommended. But we're in a situation, how do we do? So we also encourage that for those that are using uh, their own personal gadgets, they also have to ensure that uh, they follow suit uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that they put uh, their username, uh, they put the password as well as uh, if it allows uh, to put the, uh, the fingerprint. And then the other component uh, is in terms of uh, when replacing the gadgets. So, you know, sometimes people are excited, uh, you have new gadgets and then you forget even to log out on the uh, other gadgets. So whenever gadgets are being distributed, uh, it has to be a procedure. There's a procedure. Say, okay, you are getting a new tablet. Where's the old one? Uh, clear out uh, everything. If there was unsynced data, it's synced. Uh, and then uh, log in with the, uh, the new account and then uh, it continues. Thank you. Uh, just to add again, um, as stated, the, the problem is the difficult one is is, is managing people. Uh, you'll keep hearing that until you get tired of hearing me say it. But um, but pretty much to encompass everything blessings has said, mostly it's strong policies and procedures and ensuring those policies and procedures are enforced. That's because because um, the technology can only do so much. But if you make sure that uh, you have strong policies in place, you review those policies and you make sure those policies are enforced. That would usually more or less mitigate what's going on. Okay, uh, the last question, please, because we have the expert presentation. Uh, I noticed that uh, uh, passwords, some uh, places require you to change uh, relatively frequently. Some require certain strength, others are very weak. And even, uh, so I don't know whether you have any policies on that, because it's straight, it's some very sophisticated places don't seem to have your uh, policies on passwords. Um, yeah, yeah. so uh, for the passwords, uh, because mostly uh, they're using the uh, DHS to capture, of uh, which uh, like the password policy and the like it's in rent from the uh, the mother instance of the uh, the DHS to so normally uh, it's that but in terms of now like the password uh, for accessing so for logging into the uh, actual device uh, that one uh, out of control was the uh, everyone uh, is allowed to uh, put uh, his or uh, her other password but uh, the policy is only the one which is implemented on the uh, DHS to site yeah sure. uh, you're, refer you're referring to like the pin to actually open the tablet yes yeah like the pin to like to get into the device the, there's no real policy for getting into the device which it's only inside of the actual dhis to uh app that there's a specific password also uh because the the other issue we have to take into account is uh why people always put password one two three because we kind of kind of forget so there has to be that balance of being very secure but also we have to remember these people need to be able to remember the passwords that they've entered into the system and uh, we have one question on Zoom, the very, very last one. <laughs> Let's do that before moving to the next question. Okay. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, I am from Togo, and uh, I see at the top of uh, 
uh, the charts um, on the presentation I SMS implementation strategy I see at the top of that of the charts Ministry of Health I want to know more about uh, this implementation if uh, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, can get data also from a uh, from SMS or it is only the the uh, it is only implementation to send data I want to know more about it. Okay, so uh, the information security management system, uh, it's not there to keep the, uh, like uh, like keeping the data that can be used to access. It's like a system uh, that is uh, strengthening uh, the implementation of uh, another system uh, to ensure that uh, it's secure. So as it was highlighted on the uh, steps, there are things that I have to put in place. And then within that, uh, there are also some other documents that uh, you have to uh, to provide. So for example, uh, like having the, assessing the security, potential security risks, uh, uh, measuring the impact, uh, what impact are those ones uh, would have, and then identifying the controls that you do, I want to put. So all that, it's like, that's, it's like, uh, kind of a system uh, that is not there just to maybe provide access some uh, access data from uh, that system and direct but uh, it's there just to ensure that uh, it aids uh, the uh, implementation of the uh, the uh, the other system i hope your question is responded to okay let's thank you so much and we have a next uh, presentation now online. Hi, Babakar, can you unmute? Okay. And uh, share the screen. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Michael? we can. Yes, we can. And uh, Great. can awesome. you share the presentation as well? Because, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. And currently uh, uh, in the annual conference, uh, my name is Ambao Kosiste. I'm a software and security engineer. Um, I also currently work with the Gambia Minister of Health. So um, I'll be doing a presentation. Um, and the goal of this presentation is mostly to um, introduce the community um, to a tool that I've developed um, that could help um, DHS to implement this, um, conduct security assessments um, in an automated fashion. So automating DHS to security assessment. So um, a brief um, background. Um, my it's my security background it's a brief one um, been in security since 2011 back in high school days when you would go around trying to break into wi-fi networks <laughs> we're using web encryption for fun though yeah i've also been engaged in IO security research um, back in 2014 uh, to 2017 before i joined the minister of health i was part of a community um, that were involved in finding exploits, jailbreaks, IS jailbreaks, and iCloud security as well. Um, also helped, I've also helped the Gambia security, um, the Gambia police force also um, uncover or un unmask a, a cyber a cri a criminal operation um, 
um, some criminals that were engaged in robberies, high high level target robberies, and worth millions of dollars. Um, I was able to leverage my security skills, um, specifically OSINT, open source intelligence, to find the culprits and how the police um, do, do their job. Um, also, a certified a certified ethical hacker, the UC Council CH certification, also MicroMasters cybersecurity, micro credential, um, offered by Wichester Institute of Technology. It's my brief security background. So, um, we'll be talking about uh, the following points. Um, first, uh, is what is compliance, because um, before we talk about Security ass assessment, um, I think we should also um, at least talk about compliance. You know, security assessment or security and compliance work hand in hand. So you can't be doing regular security assessments and just let go and forget about compliance. It's part of it. They closely um in a related they're closely related um compliance and security are intertwined as a second why you should start automating your security assessments and the next one would be the resources uh, that we could use um especially in dhs2 implementations um these are benchmarks and other things that we could use to have uh, in our security assessments and the last one would be a demo on the tool I built to help automate the issues to security assessments. So what is compliance and why should the HS2 implementers um, care about it? So compliance is, simply put, is the action of fact of complying with one or more regulations. Um, it ensures that organizations are in line with a set of regulatory frameworks and standards specific to our industry. Example could be GDPR, general data, um, the HIPAA, the U.S. Health Insurance Portability Accountability Act, the PCI DSS, Payment Code Industry Data Security Standard, the ISO 27001, and the NIST framework also. Uh, why should DHS to implementers really care about compliance? Um, staying compliance, as we all know, especially in cracker implementations and ensures um, alignment with the respective regulatory standards and, and best practices and um, standards like GDP, um, GDPR, HIPAA, um, depending on what industry we're, we're in. Mostly healthcare, HIPAA would come into play. And if we're dealing with um, European citizen data, um, GDPR also, most likely we would have to be compliant with GDPR. Um, Compliance is a critical pillar in securing DHS implementations that handle personally identifiable information, PII. Um, so long as we are handling these um, sensitive data, um, it's very important that we are compliant, at least um, compliant to one of those regulations or following or leveraging um, to the best of, of our abilities or one of the frameworks that could help us comply um, to to the respective regulations. Um, Non-compliance can also lead to huge financial penalties and reputation damage. Um, the last thing we want to have is a data breach. And, and also the last thing we want is to be non-compliant and you know, caught not following the best practices and having to pay a huge sum um, worth millions of dollars in some cases. Compliance and security assessments are intertwined. Why? Um, solely relying on compliance without a basis on security assessments gives us a, a false sense of security. Like um, you can't be compliant without doing your regular security assessments as your penetration tests, the internal security assessments or external hiring an external firm to do um, just regular security assessments for you to make sure um, all your security your security lapses uh, are identified and approved upon. So um, they both work hand in hand. We conduct security assessments to identify and, and address the lapses in our security control controls in order to achieve compliance. So we conduct security assessments 
and make sure we've passed all the checks or at least you know, go by one of the frameworks, recommended frameworks, and to make sure our security controls are following the best practices and also uh, um, are complying to whichever regulation or standard we are, we are following. Uh, why you should start automating your security assessments? Uh, why you should automate all security checks that can be automated. Security assessments, um, as we know, can be overwhelming. Um, so automation, most of the time, automate the checks that are that can be automated um, is the best way to go because you can you could have like hundreds of checks that you're supposed to do that you're supposed to run on the system processes here, business processes, and there are different processes. So automate as much as you can, what can be automated. The rest, some, there are some processes that can't be automated, like business processes um, that has to do with policies, internal IT policies and other things. Yeah, but anything that can be automated should be automated to save time and then resources. Um, manually running, running checks, is our error prone, which can be devastating in production environments. Um, as we all know, um, most of the time when you're doing a penetration test or a security assessment, just have been following a checklist. Maybe uh, you have your organization has a dedicated checklist or that that, that you use regularly to um, run on your systems to make sure um, those security controls are in place. Um, most of the time, you don't want to do this manually, um, manually on your on your production systems because, yeah, as you all know, something may go wrong. You may run a check and um, misconfigure something, or put your whole system down, production system. In that case, automated checks can be run by non-security experts without the need to hire or pay for external services if resources are scarce, or especially in um, most DHS implementations in Africa, you all know sometimes resources can be a little um, scarce. Uh, and so having a tool that, that will help your sysadmins, even if they don't have a background in security, to just run a script and follow some best practices and see if their security controls uh, are in place or following the best practices really helps. So we should automate as much as we can in our security assessments, anything that can be automated. So um, resources, these are some of the resources we could use. Uh, DHS2 back in 20, um, 2021, uh, used to have a checklist, um, an Excel checklist that has a list of security assessments that I believe most countries we're using, um, the countries that regularly do um, security assessments on their DHS2 instances um, to that would use that as reference to make sure all those checks or the security controls are aligned with, with that checklist. So it's also a PostgreSQL um, CIS benchmark, Center for Information Security, and the Open Skype also has an Ubuntu benchmark. Why Ubuntu? Because most DHS2 imp implementations uh, are deployed um, and Ubuntu. So there's another CIS benchmark also uh, for different Ubuntu, Ubuntu distributions, 2004, 2004. Um, and last, um, the data security tools that we built to help automate. Um, the tool actually um, references the data security checklist um, and automate all the the checks that, that can be automated, which we would be digging into, uh, we, which we would take a look at. So um, demo, um, before we uh, dig into the tool, I, there are any questions? If not, we can just dig into the tool and just the HS to secure the tool. Do you have any questions so far? Okay. Okay, we can proceed. Okay. 
So, um, first off, I would like to just have a brief one through two. Um, it's a uh, it's built using leveraging Ansible, and also um, it has a set of scripts um, that are Ansible tasks um, that runs. And, um, as you can see, uh, this is, it has a GAS um, file. So this serves as a playbook, an Ansible playbook that when executed, um, Recurs this into these subtask directories and run a check. Um, so all these checks, as you can see um, in the task directory, um, there's a DB application AP, DT, and then also a vulnerability check also. And, and all these checks are referenced from the, we're taking from the DHS to um, security assessment checklist. So what I did is to kind of um, write scripts that automate each and every check. Um, so you wouldn't have to, because typically um, you would have to run some of these scripts um, manually on any system, on the systems you will be doing assessments on and which as, as I mentioned earlier, can be error prone. So, um, having doing it in an automated and tested way that shows us that you no, know, the scripts are not gonna make any changes on intended changes or modify our configurations, which could be. Yeah, so the OS level has all the checks, and we, they do check SSH. Um, configuration, security configurations, make sure they're all um, configured the right way, the permissions and, and other things. And the, or the, the database level also checks for encryption and some other, and, and many other security checks as encryption of your backups. So um, I would just show the security assessment checklist now. So uh, this is the this is what the checklist looks like. Um, it, it's provided by the DHS2 security team, uh, although it's not the most up to date security checklist assessment checklist. And, and I'm sure um, there's a better one. So in case anyone any implementation, uh, any partner, if you want to conduct a security assessment reference in this checklist, uh, you can reach out to Michael, the DHS security team. Perhaps he'll be able to provide a more up-to-date one. So you can see all these checks um, colored in yellow um, are all automated in the DHS security tools. So the other checks, um, some, some of them can be automated. And these are like business processes like incident response line and then having an IT policy and how you make it sure your end users use a secure browser. These are processes that has to be that have to be implemented and or enforced um, internally in your organizations. So um, what I would do the last um, thing is to just um, do a demo, a quick demo on the tool, how, how to run it, how to clone it from the GitHub repository, have it on your DHS2 server that you want to conduct the security assessment on and, and, and run it. It's a very straightforward thing to do. So I would just hop onto the GitHub repository.
So to use the tool, all we need to do is to just clone it from the GitHub repository. And the link is in the resources um, in the slides. So you can get it from there. So I would just clone it and up onto a live server where I would run it on. So currently it has these features. It has a security audit role, which is complete. It's also going to have a security patch role where which helps to patch every security hole that the audit may detect. And also in the future, um, an incidence response role so that could help respond to incidents in an automated way. So I would just uh, as a session to Maybe I consolidate to a bigger pro I'm probably just want to okay. yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So this is a live server. Um currently using the um not the DHS to bump box as Bob says. Uh, it's currently running the recommended way of deploying DHS to instances, which is the containerized way um, using LXC Linux containers. Um, let's see. Um, we have our containers here, the HMI as uh, proxy, that's the Nginx and the monitor, Moonin and, and, and the database. So all we need to do is to just clone yeah, you also, you have to make sure also you have Git installed on your server before you can clone. So just clone the repository. And I'm currently in my home directory. So yeah, it's there, the HSU security tools. So I just see the into it. And if I list, um, I'll see the script. So I'll, all I need to do now is to just run the script. And it should be run with pseudo privileges as well. And that's it. Um, within a few seconds, it runs those checks, all those automated checks, and gives you the summary here. If there is if there are any checks that failed, as you can see here, it's looking for the GUS binary. Um, GUS is a Go binary that uh, does the same thing as server spec. Spec for those of you that know server spec um, does is checking server configurations. So the reason I used it is that it's very fast. It's light and fast. Like so, you just um, if it was Ansible alone, um, it could have taken us a few minutes to just run all those checks. But with Gus, it does it in a few seconds. So that's why I choose it in the tool. So as you can see, um, this assessment started and there's some security, some, some important security configurations are missing in the system. 20 out of 45 tests failed. Please check report in the directory, the temp directory. That's where the report is located. Um, and we it gives us a summary also of the checks, of all the checks that are failed. Um, as you can see this is the security assessment ID. SAID means security assessment, following the DHS to security assessment checklist. So this is an OS, OS level check, um, OS 10. Uh, it checks if um, only limited services required services are exposed to the internet. That's you only have required services, no extra services like let's say uh, some other ports that you're not using exposed to the internet, you know, having Telnet, you know, and other services that really can pose um, security issues to your system. So actually the server has some services that are not supposed to be running that I'm not using. So that's why it's detected that. And also it checks for host-based security monitoring, whether there are any security monitoring loading tool also um, deployed or being utilized as we all know, um, security monitoring and alerting is key in, in making sure our systems are secure because without monitoring and knowing what's going on into our system, in our systems, it, it's very difficult to respond or, or fix holes if there are any. Um, it also checks whether 
OS level encryption is also at rest, it's also implemented. Currently, it's not implemented on this DHS2 server. So it detected that um, if database backup files have the correct um, permissions, um, database backup files, um, there's a certain permission that they should have nothing beyond 600. So it shouldn't be wall readable or writable. Um, and there should be a secure way to save, to, to store them and make sure they have the right permissions. Um, also, it checks for network-based security monitoring and lighting tool. Yeah, network-based and host-based. So there should be a network-based and a host-based security monitoring and alerting tool as for the DHS and security assessment checklist. Also checks if um, SSL rating is at least A, at least your know, SSL certificate has configurations at least that, that's A or A, A plus or at least A which is not the case here. So that's why it detected it. So availability of resource monitoring tools as well. If database backups are encrypted, offsite backups also are taken and regular automated backups are also taken, which is not the case. So it's given me all the failed test summaries. So you can quickly just view our report here from this directory, it saves it here. And from here, this gives us a comprehensive report of um, the security assessment just run. You just so you can see all the tests that have passed and filled. You see he is successful. If it is true, it means it's successful. Uh, if it is false, that it means it failed. Uh, as you can see, this one is a failed test. It was checking for disk and encryption. It, it's it's failed. So this is GOS specific. This is the GOS. Um, from, uh, format is in JSON. So uh, there are ways you can convert this to HTML and also apply some other fancy things like gradient and other things. So at the very bottom, you have the summary here, the fill count, you know, the total duration, the number of seconds or milliseconds it took. You can see it took only 1.6 um, seconds. It could have taken a lot longer if we were using just um, raw scripts or, uh, uh, or Ansible directly. So, yep, that's it. Um, to get this, we can just we can just extract this. You, you can use SCP, whatever FTP tool, SCP is recommended because it's more secure. You just extract this from your server and save it locally or share it uh, with your partners or your team and, and work on it. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for the presentation. And, and yeah, and uh, we are a bit out of time, but if you have uh, any quick questions, uh, let's uh, ask just a second. Um, yes, thank you so much for okay. yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, um, and I and I believe this this might be true, but I'm just wondering if uh, with the scripts that you have for checking, uh, yeah, with checking the systems, does it mean that it's only uh, customized or would work mainly for people who are using um, a specific uh, set up maybe setting it up with the uh, Bob's tools, or is it just um, generally applicable to to other setups? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. It's a good question. Um, so as of now, the tool only um, it supports the HS2 uh, Galaxy implementation as the way of deploying the HS2 instances um, deployment. Implementations that's using LXC containers as the Bob tools, either the Bob tools or the new DHS2 security tools. Um, yeah, and um, currently there's an issue on the repo to support also the Boombox, the DHS2 Boombox way of deployment, which is which is what is also included in the documentation, in the official DHS2 documentation. Yeah, that would be supported also um, very soon. 
Okay, thank you. So if you have any other questions, let's do it offline and in the chat. And we have one more presentation for today. Thank you, Babu Kar. Ibrahim, yes. Um, thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay. I hope you can see me. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so on my side, of course, I'll present the security and privacy in DHS2 ecosystem. By name, I'm Ibrahim Wikama from uh, University of Dar es Salaam. So today I'll try to present our use case and experience on this sector. Of course, uh, we had We can't hear you. Hello, hello. Yeah, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. There. Okay, yes, perfect. now now we can. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so I'll be talking about navigating the intersection of security and policy in DHS2 ecosystem. Mainly, I'll be, or I'll be presenting issues that address the security challenges of DHS2 APIs through the mediators. So as we know, all as uh, other previous presenters showed uh, very nice web portals or dashboards, public dashboards that users interact, uh, play with. So Excuse case, me, we can't see your screen now. OK. Can you see my screen? Nope. Not good. Uh, Okay, okay, let me fix it. Okay, let me reshare it again. Uh -huh. I think. Okay, entire screen. Mm. Mm. There? Not yet. Okay. Oh, let me share a specific window, maybe. Sorry. Do, 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 do. There? Yes, now we can. OK, so I had to share a specific window. OK, so as I said earlier, like I'll be addressing the security challenges of DHS2 APIs through the mediators. So as other presenters, uh, demonstrated or showed the portals, the web dashboards that they are easily accessible online uh, without any authentication also. So in our use case, it was more in uh, in Tanzania or in uh, based in the Ministry of Health. We have various uh, web portals which users interact. So in our case, that brought all this aspect of uh, security through the DHS2 mediators that they connect the web portals and the DHS2 backends. We had some of the uh, web portals that were a little bit sensitive with the information that they do carry or the information that they inquire from users. So through that, okay, so through that we 
like we had first to come up with a design in mind, like, okay, so how do we orchestrate all this and uh, maintain the security aspect of the whole architecture as the, as what I can say, like uh, with security policy measures in mind to secure the whole architecture and communication uh, with key aspects like authentication and authorization in the mediator in the DHS2 backend, abstracting it from the portals and also uh, making secure communication and hiding of sensitive data in the API or DHS2 API responses and the data that are being captured from the that communication between the portal and the API. So as you can see on the right side, this is a simple high level diagram architecture of the flow where the user will interact with the web portal inside the server where there'll be a middleware API that connects the web portal. And lastly, there'll be a DHS2 backend, which communicates only with the mediator API in the middle. So of course, yes, by this, uh, things look the secure by design. So time went, uh, the portal went live, people started using it. Everything was cool, like we were enjoying our life. Then there is this saying, uh, there is this quote saying, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So I think that time actually caught up. So there were uh, multiple attempts like, to one of the portal that was uh, processing or was acquiring sensitive information from the users. So there were multiple attacks to the portal, whereby uh, we noticed the, some of the malicious acts, they were, uh, they were trying to hijack it or trying to pass in unknown or some gibberish characters in the DHS2 API, basically by filtering, like they studied how the portal was communicating with the mediator through the browser network trace. Then they tried to uh, play with it by injecting various characters in the querying of the API, let's say you say query where program equals to, then that's where they inject like gibberish characters. They know themselves how they work. So that uh, led to incidences that were unexplainable. Like for example, we started noticing, okay, suddenly the DHS2 freezes like, it's up and running, but actually like it's unresponsive. So we noticed the like, okay, what is happening? After going to the server, trying to diagnose these things, you might find like the server was down. For example, you can see the picture on the right top. Actually the instance was down for like 39 minutes. So actually it wasn't down, but actually it was in a mode of processing something that it doesn't understand. So in the end, it tries to eat up all the CPUs. It tried to eat up, uh, it eats up all the RAM inside all the resources available. So that actually was so frustrating on us because like, okay, so what was happening? What is going on? So after that, we had to do a threat analysis, like what is going on? As you can see in the bottom picture, these actually were logs that were being logged by the mediator, like what was coming in. You could see uh, people or attackers were trying to inject some URL codes or params which they wanted to see the passwords in the slash etc slash password directory. Good thing is that uh, all this uh, orchestration, uh, this one back here, it's a de uh, Dockerized, dockerized the architect, like uh, the DHS2 is dockerized, the API middleware is dockerized, the port, everything is uh, dockerized. So after ana analyzing the threats, we notice, okay, so at least the impact, like they didn't have the entire system, their effect was only inside or it was contained inside the dock orchestration. But then we wondered, okay, so why did uh, DHS2 mis uh, misbehave or acted that way? So we noticed that there are some types of queries that you can make direct to the DHS2 API. It will not go down, but actually DHS2, will, it will go in a mode of processing kind of. So it will block any other requests until that uh, that request is being solved. So most of the requests they were, were holding suspense. For example, even if you try to authenticate, 
it will hold if you even if you try to maybe query another api resources it will stay on hold so how to meet your how to solve that it was you have to manually restart the dhs2 instance yeah so that went on uh, we had like a, a little bit of complaints, like, for example, let's say if there were scenarios in the airport, like travelers were tried a little bit, they, they were tried a little bit to use the system, and the system wasn't available, was unresponsive. So there were travelers are furious, many furious, like everybody's furious. So after that, uh, we had to update the architecture, like, okay, so how do we, uh, how do we solve this? So we had uh, some few security reinforcements. So basically, uh, there were three key uh, aspects needed to be strengthened and monitored. So the first, what we do, uh, we did the this nginx URL, uh, URL filtering, automatically got suspicious URL patterns. I think uh, one of the presenters earlier presented about that virtual virtual patching. So this is something like that, but it might be not like that direct, but it's more of dealing with Nginx, automatically ignore uh, certain URL matching patterns that we introduce to filter this kind of malicious attempts. Uh, second thing, uh, in the immediate API, uh, incoming payloads, uh, we introduce the inspection because we noticed also some of the attackers used those payloads, let's say in the portal you have a, an input of, let's say, first name, you're trying to register first name, that's where somebody injects uh, some gibberish characters inside that input. When it goes to DHS2, it will cause uh, that harm of uh, DHS2 being in suspense mode, like it's trying to resolve something it doesn't understand. So we introduce in the middleware here API by filtering or inspecting the payloads that they are coming are they safe or do they have that pattern of uh, attack? Then thirdly, in the DHS, because we are using the DHS to localize the implementation, we to patch the Glow root. I do believe most of you are aware of it. After that, the DHS2 and Glow two are running parallel inside the same same uh, container or the same same Docker image. With that, helped us to monitor the resource usage, the amount of uh, traffic it gets, the slow traces, like what holds up the computation of the instance, what uh, uses much resources, what API calls they are so intensive, and etc. In order, like for us, to act quick and uh, to like to stop any kind of unsuspected or any suspicious behavior that DHS might might uh, experience. So all this architecture basically it was to protect the DHIS from being attacked by those outside attackers. Or I think one of the we we found like there was a company that was trying to do penetration testing to the, through that portal. Yeah. So with this uh, vulnerability patches and reinforcement, all midnight crises and sudden system outages were completely gone because like you can see based on this uh, flow here, like we just tried to update the middleware and also we tried to update the Nginx URL filtering mechanism with heavy monitoring. So my message uh, is security is a race against time. Vulnerability may exist long before you discover them. Uh, act with agents to identify and patch vulnerabilities before they, they are exploited. Asante san. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? Okay. Oh. Austin, first. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I wonder if the, you were uh, attending the, the public portal session. I think there's a lot of uh, similar considerations and similar uh, approaches that you took as well. Um, so yeah, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on kind of a, 
a standardized way to to go about protecting public access to to data um, as you've done here and some of the considerations we had there particularly maybe pushing versus pulling data to to prevent access to dhs2 for particularly public uh, use cases Of course, yes, uh, I try to attend that. I think uh, most of the implementation that you, uh, the Waelia presented, uh, I was glad some of them we already, uh, already implemented. But uh, for in our case, how this portal work were more of uh, both sides, like pulling and pushing, because at some point it was pulling data from the portal to the uh, DHS, and some point it is pushing like so. You know, I said like it was in both, but it was not in one direction. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Good. Good. Interesting uh, learnings. I think for for everyone to to consider, especially when opening up DHS to 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 larger audiences. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you once again. And uh, that's all for today on security session. And uh, I'll be in the expert lounge for those who would like to talk about further security topics. And uh, have a great conference days ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.